Welcome to the Ask Faleschini podcast with a guest. I'm proud to present Matt Larsson from Sweden. He's a second time guest on our podcast. And that is because Matt has written a new book, a book called The, the Severe Economic and Social Consequences of the Rapid Change to Electric Vehicles. Matt, please tell us more about the consequences of the rapid change to electric vehicles. Yes. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, the change to electric vehicles has barely been prepared so far. Uh, preparations have not yet started on a large scale because um, the complexity, there is a tremendous amount of complexity here where uh, it's not only about changing vehicles to uh, electric, it's about changing, it, expanding um power generation, power grids, um, and uh, charging infrastructure. And it's also about training a lot of people who will need to participate and drive this change forward. So um, uh, there are a number of different areas that need to be taken into account to um, plan and uh, prepare for the change. So, and, and these prepar preparations, as I said, have not yet started, not even in, in the EU, where decisions have been made both to um, um, ban the sales of petrol and diesel cars from 2035, and also more recently to phase out very rapidly uh, diesel trucks from 2030 through 2035 and 2040. Uh, so um, the investments will have to be made in all places, in all local areas, in power grids, in charging infrastructure, and in all countries in terms of, of expansion of power generation. And this will need a, a huge amount of resources uh, in terms of people who know how to build these systems, um, how to structure them, um, electromobility strategists, as I call them, electromobility architects. And those are barely present at, um, uh, right now. Yeah, can I just interrupt you? Would you say, you're hinting at it, but you did not say it out loud. Would you say that the legislator get, uh, so got ahead of themselves uh, by imposing such a strict rules, like uh, banning the diesel trucks by uh, 2040, and uh, similar. Is it possible that this is just a trend and that there is going to be the opposite trend in the near future when the diesel trucks will come back and uh, where uh, things will not be? Uh, right now, everything is uh, uh, electricity or nothing. Uh, do you think that uh, there is going to be a more, let's say, Toyota's approach uh, to towards mobility when they say okay we can build one uh, electric uh, car or we can build uh, six uh, plug-in hybrid cars or we can build 90 uh, just uh, mild hybrid cars uh, do you think that legislator will start to follow this uh, let's say toyota's narrative more then right now they are following almost fully the Tesla narrative. Everything has to be electric. What, what's your take on that? Well, this is one of the more worrying aspects or one of the most worrying aspects because decisions have been made and the EU has legislated that these changes uh, will have to go through. And automotive companies are preparing for this large-scale change, they are starting to dismantle um, production of uh, uh, petrol and diesel cars and, and diesel trucks. Uh, so so they, they are starting to prepare, but we will find out uh, at some point that we can't go forward w uh, at this rapid pace. And the worry I have is that um, there will not be enough resources to go back or continue to produce um, petrol and diesel vehicles um, on a sufficiently large scale to maintain transportation systems. If we move, if the automotive industry starts to move very rapidly towards electric cars, they will build up 
the, the supply chains and, and the production resources needed to, to make those. And they will dismantle the ones that produce uh, petrol and diesel vehicles. So uh, my worry is, is that, that yes, uh, we will find out, the legislators will eventually find out that we can't drive this development at the pace uh, intended. But uh, the most worrying aspect is that, that um, um, the automotive industry and, and the suppliers and so on are forging ahead and, and making decisions and, and dismantling um, very important and very valuable industrial structures that will be very costly and probably uh, almost impossible to rebuild once they are uh, they have been dismantled uh, as we see in some industries where where stuff where uh, pr uh, supply chains have been um, broken down we can't easily once more and rapidly bring up uh, and increase production so so this is um, a really important and very difficult aspect to handle legislators need to very rapidly explore and, and analyze the amount or, or the, the pace that this a realistic pace for this uh, change and they they need to set uh, decide about a timetable that is realistic rather than uh, the present one that's uh, uh, unrealistic and that can't be uh, gone through with I, I would like to uh, address another issue that you already mentioned in the beginning there is a huge lack of people uh, that you call um, electric mobility architects. And there is a huge lack of different experts uh, because we know that the, let's say, uh, internal combustion uh, car industry has been built over a century. And there, there is enough uh, trained mechanics, there is enough uh, support services, there is eno enough financial services. All, all the... Um, not, not uh, so much the infrastructure, but the whole ecosystem has been built over a century. And now uh, there was uh, this illusion that you can use the same ecosystem and go from internal combustion engine to electric engine. However, there are a lot of, um, despite uh, the a lot of similarities, there is even more uh, things that have, change and that are completely different and that uh, they demand completely different knowledge. And we know that to educate certain person, okay, you, you have this so-called uh, over weekend education programs that are uh, really popular now. However, for all the strategic functions, uh, there's up to 20 years of training required. For example, you're an expert, but you have over 30 years of experience as a business and management consultant. And that is not something that you could do over a weekend. So uh, the, the, the biggest challenge is uh, where do countries and continents uh, find all these uh, experts or how long will it take to educate them? And plus, you need a firsthand experience on the field, not just uh, going uh, to uh, attend a university program. So... Um, what would you think would be realistic uh, time to to switch to electric mobility uh, if we take the lack of the human resources in uh, in consideration and let's focus on US and uh, EU? Uh, what what time? How long would it take that this transition would uh, have the ability to become sustainable transition? Uh, not something that has to be done overnight despite of all the consequences or, and the costs. You already mentioned that because of all the legislative pressure, uh, companies are already starting the dismounting the facilities with internal combustion engines. So uh, what's your realistic take if we focus solely on uh, people, so human resources required to, to, to uh, execute this change? Yes, thank you, Peter. I really appreciate your insight into this, and uh, uh, you've described correctly, I think, uh, the background. Um, it's, I think, it'll take a considerable uh, amount of time 
it, of course, I've I have 30 years background as a business strategist and and the change manager, but people don't need to work for 30 years to learn about these things, uh, fortunately. Uh, but I've managed uh, over the past year or so to um, uh, get companies, uh, tr training companies in Sweden started on um, uh, applying for financing for um, uh, vocational training programs of two years. Uh, and, and that's for electromobility strategists and electromobility architects. So, but this government fu these government funded programs, they will apply, th these companies will ap apply for them uh, towards the summer this year, and they may start then um, uh, to train people um, in uh, the autumn of two th uh, 2025. And they will then, um, and the programs will then be of a du duration of uh, two years. And those will, will not be um, university uh, programs, but vocationally more um, practical uh, trainings uh, and and these roles as uh, electromobility strategists and electromobility architects they barely exist today some people have acquired the knowledge because they have worked with um, electromobility uh, in various uh, um, automotive companies utilities but they haven't most of them haven't looked at the complexity and haven't realized the complexity of large scale change. They have learned about how to, to um, uh, develop mo engines and how to develop um, like power grids and so on. But very few people have the, the, an overall view, uh, a holistic view of all the changes that need to be, be made and how these changes Will need will uh, interact with each other and and influence each other. So how will the the need to expand power grids influence the need to train people to to uh, to do this? And how will the need to expand power grids uh, influence our ability to to um, uh, or or the timing of the expansion of um, charging infrastructure, for example? And how do we need to adjust our pace of implementing or changing the, the vehicle systems, uh, the vehicle fleets um, in to fit the pace of the expansion of the charging infrastructure, et cetera. These, these, this type of knowledge and, and this type of understanding is will be necessary for the people who will be electromobility experts. And say from, from now on, we, we, we're looking at in Sweden where this is actually underway. We don't know if these companies that apply for these uh, trainings will get financing in the first year. They may have, have to apply once or twice or, or even three times until they, they get started. But once they get started, there will be a training course for, for two years. Um, so the first students from these trainings may be, um, be ready by... 2028 or something like that. So, and those for each uh, each class, there will be perhaps 30 students uh, with various um, specialization and so on. So, but there will be a need for thousands of these people in each country because they will be needed in very different industries, in different uh, different uh, companies, um, and also. In different local and re, uh, local regions, to be able to to make decisions there about the uh, uh, the development, and of course uh, during this time people will learn on the job as well. So so it's not as if these uh, these training courses will be the only source, but it illustrates one aspect of this this knowledge uh, knowledge development, and that hasn't even been started in most other countries. Um, we've been uh, running a pro project with German professors, uh, Polish professors, and I've been looking a little um, at, at other, other countries as well. And Sweden is, is ahead because we have one of the largest penetrations of electric vehicles, electric cars and electric uh, uh, trucks at present uh, in the EU uh, and in the world, uh, in fact, uh, after Norway, Iceland. But uh, we still don't have enough 
competence in, in terms of strategists and architects and a lot of technology specialists that will be needed uh, to, to, to run this forward. I, I thank you for all these insights. I have uh, an, another uh, politically incorrect question right now. Uh, you mentioned all the knowledge and everything, but uh, when you were talking about the social consequence, one is that there is going to need to be a different structure of knowledge in the society. Um, just a, a, a quick um, uh, view I would like to get from you is, uh, do you believe that electric vehicle will also change the so-called social structure of uh, our society? Uh, will there need to be change uh, in our government structures? Uh, will there need to be change in our voting structures uh, because the um, the energy will become so much more important uh, because the uh, there, there's going to be a different uh, knowledge will be more it will be gaining importance than now because now uh, most money is made in the financial industry but uh, this could uh, soon change if uh, we, we undergo all these. Uh, so-called technical uh, challenges. Uh, wh what do you think will happen with our society? Will there be a different democracy? How will we structure it? That's very interesting. Um, I don't think uh, that we need to restructure democracy uh, because in Sweden and most countries, we already have an energy minister who's responsible for for. Uh, energy issues. Uh, we, we do have um, politicians that work with these things, um, but we need to, of course, the importance of these roles will need to increase immensely. Uh, and the, the, the uh, administration that's connected to the energy uh, the ministry um, will, will have to increase as well. Um, okay, so um, another provocation. The, there is a mandatory kill off switch in the cars already. And because they're electric, you can stop them uh, immediately. So don't you think that the people uh, that are now in power uh, will get, get even more power and power will be more centralized? And there will be huge challenges how to, um, how to regulate the misuse of power. Don't you? Um, we lose yes. a lot of uh, a lot of human rights. Yes, I, I've been um, discussing um, a lot with a professor uh, in uh, who's a an expert in uh, the electricity supply uh, in Sweden, and he's he, he, we, we've discussed and and we we found that uh, at present there are no opportunities in democracies to actually control these the, the use of electricity in detail uh, technically i i believe there is there are opportunities but there would have to be legislation um a new type of le legislation to make this possible uh, on a large scale uh, at least as far as i i understand and when when electricity demand increases, there is no way to prioritize different users. We have uh, two big steel steel plants in uh, in um, uh, the north of Sweden that will use a lot of electricity because they will be converted to hydrogen. Um, they they will be hydrogen powered in the near future, and they will need thirty percent of Sweden's electricity. In addition to this, we have increasing demand from other uh, areas as well, and we will have to um, to uh, uh, we, we will see electric car fleets, electric truck fleets increase uh, dramatically. But there's no opportunity at present uh, to. Um, prioritize the, the various uh, needs. So all users are likely to experience higher prices and also um, uh, shortfalls uh, of electricity in uh, at some points uh, and, and at increasing uh, frequency of, of shortfalls and increasingly high prices. Uh, and this will be difficult to, uh, uh, to manage uh, in a, in a structured way so that 
because the investors in these uh, steel plants have made, uh, invested a lot of money and the, the, the people who have bought uh, electric cars, etc., they they expect to be able to use uh, electricity and to, to be able to charge them. So it will create an enormous strain on um, um, the power supply and also on the polit political system in various ways to control these things. Okay, I will I will uh, give another provocation out. Uh, the biggest challenge right now that we face is that a lot of the resources um, connected with internal combustion uh, cars and infrastructure to run them uh, is already paid off. And now we're going into a new economic cycle where, where we have to finance everything again, even if the existing uh, infrastructure is working and it's already paid off, we are now forced by legislation uh, to go into debt just to survive and adapt to the legislation. Um, how, how, wh what's your take on that? I, I, I don't like it. I'm a conservative businessman. I would like to drive my car another uh, 50 years if possible in, in order to pay the least amount for the maintenance and, and all this stuff. And now I have to buy an electric car because else I cannot drive in the city and uh, similar, especially in Germany, there is more and more bans uh, for uh, old cars, uh, except if you have an old timer, then you can go in the, in the, in the city, but with an old car with the Euro free or something like that norms, uh, you're, you're not even able to go in the city anymore. So you have to park outside and uh, take a train uh, or a subway to the city. Uh, and this all, um, so that, for me, for example, that is a cut down on my liberties because I used to go to the city center with a car and um, my car is paid off. And if I want to buy a new car, I have to save money. So I have to lower my savings or I have to go into debt in order to get a new car that is correspondent to all these um, new politics. So um, how, how, will, how will this negatively affect the economy is is there because everyone is talking that if we spend more money that is uh, better for gdp and all this stuff but uh, for me as an individual if i have a paid off car and i have to buy a new one and i have to assume debt for that uh, that is worse for me so uh, wh where do you see the, where's the trade off what will i get uh, as a return to to renounce my uh, let's say uh, savings for a new car Yes, um, economists uh, sometimes refer to this uh, notion that uh, uh, increasing investments will uh, drive, drive uh, economic growth as the broken window fallacy, um, because it, it, it's tantamount to saying that if you break your, your window at home, you will increase uh, the um, uh, the um, um, well, uh, economic growth and so on by by having to repair a new. But there are a lot of of negative um, aspects of of having to repair and having to build new systems. So it's not only it does drive economic growth to a certain extent. To to uh, but there to build up these huge systems that will be needed for power supply, power um, distribution and charging will require very large investments. And as you say, it's not easy for individuals either to, um, to simply buy an electric car overnight and, and abandon or, or trade in the, the um, petrol or diesel truck or petrol or diesel uh, car uh, in, instead, and, and invest in an entirely new vehicle just over just because uh, uh, legislators have decided they must. So, so there, I've own, I'm only a one person, and I've 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 tried to draw up a holistic view of of this development and and indicate some areas where we will find that it will be challenging for both for people and for, for the global economy at large and for national eco economies. And, but I haven't been able to dig into detail in each, every one of the, these uh, areas. So the, 
the question you are asking is only um, indicating that in your, your case, the car, your car, and, and the and your ability to drive, and your ability to use your car, and the cost of of investing in a new car, um, they uh, these big decisions will interfere with your private finances and and your uh, ability to um, lead your life as as you are used to. And there are a number of different areas which we have discuss been discussing in this. Um, podcast uh, that where we need to make similar analyses like uh, power generation, power grids, or, or not only one power grid, it's power grids all over and different levels from local to regional and national. Uh, there are, there's um, charging infrastructure, um, vehicle fleets, and training programs. And all of these have to be built up almost well, not, let's not say from scratch, but from a very low level. Mm -hmm. uh, and that will require huge investments, both for individuals who have to retrain or retrain for new for jobs in new areas, for, for uh, governments, but also for companies that need to, to uh, uh, invest in these technologies. And it will take decades for this to for, for people and for for companies and and governments to be able to just to adjust to these um, um, these new requirements thank you very much for all these insights uh looking forward to reading the whole book uh, <laughs> in the near uh, future and uh, i will share links uh to to your uh, newest book where you uh, discuss all the, or you address all the topics that we have discussed in this uh, podcast. And thank you very much for uh, being my guest tonight. Thank you very much, Fita. Uh, it was a pleasure.